Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Becky Metcalf, and on behalf of Design Centre Chelsea Harbour, a very warm welcome to Conversations in Craft. Now, uh, first some housekeeping. I get to do all the exciting things. If I could ask everybody just to turn their phones to silent, that would be really kind. Thank you. Well, this new series promises insights from the craft industry's leading lights. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today uh, ceramic artist Kate Malone, Bill Amberg, founder of uh, Bill Amberg Studios, and glass and mixed media artist Chris Day. Who better to talk to them about the materials that have defined their lives and work but uh, Grant Gibson, podcaster and writer. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Grant, but let's give them a very warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, you're people, you're three-dimensional, <laughs> and you're here. That's extraordinary. I have no idea. Well, maybe you do have an idea, but it's fantastic to see you uh, and to do this in front of a crowd, and a very handsome one as well, if I may say. Um, could I just check, just because so, I'm kind of intrigued as to who you all are, um, it's kind of a show of hands first up, it's kind of interactive. This is the interactive bit because unfortunately we can't have questions because apparently there's been a pandemic over the last 18 months and sharing mics isn't such a good idea. But um, show of hands, uh, do we have makers in the audience? Quite a few. Designers? No, lazy. Architects? <laughs> Collectors? Students? Sort of, you're not sure, maybe, part-time. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody I've missed out? <laughs> photographers. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you, are you, you're, not, you're not a photographer, you're just waving. No. <laughs> okay. Just waving at front. <laughs> 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 oh. Well, look, according to this, this stopwatch I have in front of me, which is ticking the whole time, I have 43 minutes and 54 seconds uh, to talk to three brilliant artists, uh, the notion being that they all work in a different material, and the session is going to investigate the material that has kind of helped shape their lives, how they discovered it, and how it's changed their, their careers. So, um, yeah, in the first instance, I guess the best thing to do would be to kick off and ask, how did you first come across the materials that you came across? Kate, let's kick off with you. Clay, how did you discover clay? Clay at school, at a big, progressive, comprehensive school, and they had the most, I didn't realize it, they had the most amazing art department. It was so brilliantly run, it had its own block. And it had a pottery room under the stairs of E-Block. And I remember age 12, sort of lifting myself up and looking through this, this window that was smeared with clay and seeing the inside, wondering, literally wondering what the jars were on the shelves, wondering what the kiln was. And I couldn't wait to get in, it was like beckoning me in. <laughs> and so age 13, I managed to get in and my pottery teacher from when I was a child passed away last year and he'd cashed in his pension and bought all my pots instead. And oh, you wow. know, we had this incredible, we'd lost contact, but he was this good teacher. Yeah. And that's what it's down to. It's good education, good teaching, good facilities. But even before you had, you met the teacher, there was obviously something. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. And what was quite funny is he was quite dishy or he was quite different, <laughs> he was helped. bohemian. <laughs> and uh, I remember him being different. Yeah, he was sort of dusty and a bit sloppier than the others. Mm. So it was the, the whole sort of yeah, aura of it was just, and it's still the same. Never, you know, see a pottery studio. I can't wait to get mm. in. Mm. <laughs> well, it's quite interesting because, I mean, I think both Chris and Bill have had quite circuitous routes into the profession. I mean, Chris, okay. you, how did you get into glass? Because you were, you were a plumber originally, right? Yeah, plumbing and eating engineer. And then um, my wife, uh, she was studying at uh, university, and she says, you've got to go university. And um, recently finding out that I was dyslexic, obviously doing something that was academic, I didn't really want to do. Um, but when I was 16, I loved art. So I thought, well, if I've got to go to university, I'll do a subject that I really had a passion for when I was young. Um, going around the, um, the, the Wolves University, uh, looking at the different studios, there was woodwork, metalwork, which I'd already done in my career. And I thought, glass and ceramics, I haven't got that T-shirt, I'd mm. like to have a go. And uh, went down into the studio, seen the potter's wheels, seen the furnaces, and I thought, I've never had the opportunity to do or uh, handle this material. Let's give it a go. And once I started, that was it. You know, the, the world was my oyster. Absolutely loved it. And I loved the way that um, both glass and ceramics, it's 
you've got to be able to touch it and and feel the material. Well, that's quite interesting because I think I think to the the outsider they would say that with leather and with clay, when you're making those, that's a very tactile experience. I mean, glass for obvious reasons, yeah. you're not using your hands in quite the same way. But you would disagree with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I dare say Kate will say the same, is on the potter's wheel, you're on there and you're using your hands to actually manipulate the clay into a form. And it's exactly the same with the glass. You've got your wheel, but it's, it's turned upside down. So you become the wheel. You're still having to marver and mold that glass material. You're still having to touch it with the paper and, and make it into a shape. So although you can't touch it with your bare hand, you've got tools and implements, so you've still got this touchy-feely way of mm. op operating the material. Mm. Mm. I mean, Bill, you've been sitting there very patiently whilst, I, whilst <coughs> my attention has been on this side of the stage. Um, you grew up in Northampton, right? So was leather, it's the centre of leather in this country, was, was leather always going to be where you, you found yourself? Well, I think it was certainly one of the things that my poor parents tried to, um, to give me to entertain myself, because I wasn't, I'm very dyslexic, like Chris, and... Um, and I struggled at school, but and and uh, I was searching for things to keep myself occupied. And um, my parents, rather than berating me for it, just encouraged me to make things. And leather was one of the materials that was available in Northampton on the market. It was very available, and um, I was just encouraged to play with it. And just working with a material that's so sympathetic, um, it, it's so giving. It just became a fascination that's remained mm. with me ever since. But were you, your parents, were, was there making and art in your household? Was that, how, was that your way in? My, your mum was an architect. My right? mum was an architect and my dad, I, lived, I grew up with my grandparents as well and he was a great maker. He was always, he had a workshop at home, my grandfather did and my father had a workshop. And so f effectively my mum designed it and my dad made it. Um, and it was just how I, you know, what we, how I grew up. So there was a lot of making going mm. on. So I did a lot of woodwork, a lot of metal work, a lot of different, um, you know, playing around with materials. But leather just became this fascinating material. And, and, then, I, and then I met, when I travelled after school, um, it was a great thing to, to, to be able to travel with, you know, weirdly. Mm -hmm. You could turn up in a town in New Zealand or in Australia or wherever, and you could get a job with a hippie or with a... Uh, with a, a cobbler or the saddler or something, and, and you just started to absorb information, absorb skill, techniques, understand more and more about the material. Mm. I mean, what's kind of interesting about your three career paths is that, Chris, you, you had this, well, it sounds like you were kind of dragooned by your wife Defin into, into yeah, Wolverhampton. You, you had no choice in the matter. No, you're going <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I mean, Kate, you did the whole Royal College of Art thing. Bill, you didn't go to university. Did you decide you just didn't want to go, that you didn't need to go? Why, why didn't you go? You worked on the oil rigs instead, right? Yeah. I you went to Aberdeen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, need to, I wanted to go traveling. That was my big thing. And, and I wanted to get some money together. And, and the oil rigs were a fantastic way of making money in 1979. Mm. And um, so I did that. And then when I was traveling, I, as I said, I did lots of leather work. But I then met an extraordinary leather worker in Adelaide. Um, who became a complete mentor to me. And, and um, I did a, a sort of apprenticeship with her. And she was very <coughs> rigorous in her technique. So she absolutely taught me technique, technique, technique. But at the same time, she was incredibly loose and really wanted me to experiment. So in the time that I wasn't working for her doing formal leather working, she was encouraging me to pull, bend, melt, burn, manipulate, mm. dye this material to try and make it do stuff. And, and that's really my career. <laughs> that's what's happened. And now that's the way the studio operates, you know. I mean, I'm quite intrigued with you two because you, you came out of, well, you came out of the Royal College, you came probably back from Australia Ooh. or the oil rigs or whatever it was you've been doing. But you came out in London kind of early to mid-80s um, and it, it sounds like a very different time. I mean, I'm just wondering if you can describe, maybe, Kate, what London was like. You left the Royal College, and you, you had free studio space, right? The yeah. Royal Festival Hall. Yeah, there was a, there's a railway, Hungerford Bridge next yeah. to the Royal Festival Hall. 
Ken Livingstone sort of saw the empty arches and said they could be used for craft, and it was set up as the South Bank Craft Center, and it was free studios, about nine foot by nine foot, in exchange for the public being able to come in and watch you work. But I actually, as pottery seemed to be deemed as a slightly dangerous activity, I was in a back arch, so the public <laughs> didn't have to, you know, they didn't come by all the time. Right. So it was a railway arch, and the tramps lived in the front door and used the front door as a toilet, and it was really, really rough. That whole area was like no man's land, mm. the South Bank. You know, it was before the big wheel and everything else. So it was really kind of a raw area. But it was free for a year and a half to set yourself up out of college. And there was a kiln plumbed into the Royal Festival Hall. So we p didn't pay an electricity bill, which was hugely formative for me because mm. I, I was so broke. I had a day a week teaching and I was living in a friend's house and cycling around. And, and um, basically, um, if a pot didn't work, I, I'd spent money on the clay and I put it back in again because I just thought I can't bin it. So I developed a whole technique through not having money of having tiny amounts of lots of different glazes that I tested at the Royal College and bought back little tiny scraps of glaze after my MA mm. into the studio. So I had lots of sort of leftover scraps of, clay, of glaze and free electricity, and I developed the technique that I use today, which is multiple firing and hand applying the glazes, many different ones. So it was built, you know, I, it was, my technique was developed from adversity rather than anything else. In this railway arch with trains going over, I, mean, I had to have umbrellas over my desk because <laughs> bits of the concrete would fall on the work. <laughs> and you could, well, it was before mobile phones, but you couldn't hear anybody on a telephone anyway because the trains were mm. so constant on Hunkford Bridge. So it was kind of rite of passage that was fantastic, mm. really fantastic times. I mean, so this is where the, because you have this huge library, uh, I've seen this recipe book of, of yeah. glazes that you have, it's yeah. extraordinary, this is where this started. It sort of started from there, mm. yeah, and appreciating uni using glaze like a palette rather than a flat thing. So it was like, I just wanted to learn more and more about the way pigments, the chemistry of the way pigments taint, tint a clear glaze. It's very mm. straightforward, actually. Mm. You know, I get a clear body, a clear gla base glaze, and then just try. There are about ten minerals that you can use, and just the combinations are endless to get different effects, and that's continued to this day. Yeah. And what about formally? Because I mean, you're best known, I guess, for the kind of the, the gourds and the, the pumpkins of the, the the fruit. You're smiling at me like yeah. I shouldn't have asked this question. No, I love it. I love uh, that question. That's lovely. But so, so when did formally? When did when did that kind of work start? I don't know. It just came from. I, you know, I love nature always. And when I was at the Royal College, everything was about the sea. I loved a theme. Mm. I really like a theme. <laughs> and uh, it was the sea. And then it was nature of the sea, nature of the land. And more recently, it's nature of the magma in the center of the earth. So it's all still nature. And it all came from nowhere, really. You know, my dad said when I was two, I used to sort of look at flowers and pull them apart. Mm. And, you know, just this sort of intrigue for detail, which is the same with the glazes. And it's just so... Yeah, I don't think it came from any body in particular. Well, it is quite fascinating because you're living in Kent now, but for yeah. the longest time, you were living in kind of gritty, particularly years, yeah. gritty when you first moved in, Very Dalston. Gritty, I mean, yeah. you're as far from nature as you can, well, there's... Oh, well, that's but, really... But you're, but you're yeah. not in a field in the middle yeah, of nowhere. That, you're that's not a country so interesting potter. because I don't want to... to, to, to but you've just touched on it. Because when I lived in the city, I made these fine, fine natural things mm. that were very laboured and like haute couture, they were like dressing a pot. And when I did move to the south of France and lived in Provence for seven years, everything seemed so silly. And I made very simple things. And it's so very affected by the need for nature. In a city, you need nature. Mm. So people have a pot if they don't have a garden. So it seemed to work. That wasn't my intention, but that's what seemed to happen. Interesting. I mean, Bill, you came out... Uh, where well you opened your studio, you came back from Australia, came off the oil rigs, came back from Australia, opened a uh, workshop in Rotherhive? Rotherhive, yeah. And, and, but you seem to be hanging out with Nigel Coates and the NATO kind of cutting edge architecture crew in a squat somewhere in Kensington, as far as I can <laughs> remember. Um, I mean, how did that come about? Well, I think London then, I, I think it's hard to imagine, but London was, was cheap. Mm. You know, place was cheap, you could get a studio really cheaply, and food was cheap, clothes were cheap, alcohol was cheap, <laughs> um, you know, you could, you could survive on, you know, a, a breath of air, really. Mm. So it just kind of encouraged this incredibly creative period, I think. It was a very vital 
time in London. Their music was amazing. And I think it just started to encourage mashing up of lots of different ideas and lots of different... Everything seemed looser and freer and easier in a, in a way. Mm. I mean, there wasn't any money anywhere, but it was, it was good fun and very creative. And I think that's what sparked the conversation between creative people. It just seemed very open. There were lots of studios everywhere. You could get a studio very, very cheaply. So you could set up, you know, I mean, I had countless studios, always getting bumped on from one place to the next, but it didn't really matter. Whereas now I, I look at, you know, some of the young people that we're trying to help now in, in terms of work, and I, I worry that they can't find a space easily. Or mm. If they find a space, it's really expensive and really complicated, and it ties people down. In, in, and that's not what people should be thinking about. When, when, when you want to start to work, you just want to release yourself from all of that and just start exploring a material that you enjoy. But also, for the pair of you, it felt almost as if you were in opposition to a government that maybe wasn't sympathetic to... I mean, you talked about Ken Livingstone, who was mm. running London at the mm. time, GLC, mm. but we had Margaret Thatcher in, in power in the, the early 80s, who maybe wasn't as th uh, that sympathetic to cutting-edge creativity. No, but, I do, I, but having said that, a lot was going on abroad. You know, Japan seemed to be really exciting. Mm. America was really exciting. You could sort of, you know, smell change. You know, there was this, because there was something to push against, I think that, that encouraged change and that encouraged creativity. Mm. But, I mean, your rise, the way you tell it, Bill, almost sounds frictionless. Like, you made some bags, you took them personally to Liberty. They said, we like those. Paul Smith did the same. I mean, is that true? Is that, was it that straightforward? It, 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 I think it was open. It was open. Mm. I mean, I'd, and, and also, I think travelling... I spent two and a half years travelling, and I think that opens your... Um, that, that makes you braver. Mm. It makes you fearless, and it stops you worrying about what people think or say of you. And so I did. I literally... Somebody said, oh, you should go to this shop in Floral Street. It's really cool. They, they, it's called Paul Smith. They'd, they'd like your bags. And I just sort of literally... I just walked in the door and said, I want to meet, speak to Mr Smith. And um, <laughs> they went, oh, yeah, well, you can see him next Tuesday. And I turned up with the bags, and he went, oh, I love them. I'll have them. And it was kind of, that's how it started. Mm. But then having these conversations and hanging out with architects and what have you, they started to say, can we, you know, what about furniture? What about flooring? What about, you know, how else can we use the material? And I, and I, I was also very interested in different tanneries in the same way as Kate explores glaze. There's so much variety in leather. You know, people are completely used to one type of material because that's what the leather that they see. But leather is a, is a, there's an extraordinary variety of materials. So not only from the different animals that you can tan, but the different tanneries are, you know, very artisanal. There's a real kind of, there's a real alchemy in tanning, mm. particularly vegetable tanning. So you can go to areas in Italy, Santa Croce is a whole tanning town. You know, there's 140 tanneries in one town. They really smell. It doesn't anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but, you know, you can go to all of these different vegetable tanneries and there's probably one, two or three people working in them, that's all. And, and they're still making, well, they're all making vegetable tan leathers, but every single tannery's got a different take on it. Mm. They've got a little different in the chemistry and they've, they've got a different private source of, of raw material and they make something different. And you start to explore that and it's like, wow, this is a mm. world of material that you can... Mm. mess around with. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because, um, I mean, as I say, the, the pair of you came, emerged at a particular time. I mean, Chris, your work, which, I mean, you really just, in the last 2019, I think I'm right in saying, yeah. that you, you graduated. So your work has come out at a very different time and, and we're in a kind of post, well, we're in the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and your, your work is, is really focused on the black experience, I think I'm right in saying. I mean, maybe you could explain a little bit about the thinking behind your pieces. Yeah, definitely. So, um, black identity is very prominent in the work that I do. Um, and also, my own identity. Um, black Lives Matter, I was, I was producing work about racism, segregation, civil rights, and slavery way before George Floyd happened. You know, there's been thousands of George Floyds in mm. the world but it's never been represented or talked about. 
And um, ever since I started, I wanted to talk about these aspects of history that were brutal. Um, and art gave me that chance. It gave me a chance of expressing something and having a conversation because this conversation's got to be said or had by both, both parts. But how do you have that conversation? How do you sit in a room and start talking about it? But art actually gave me that way of putting something in a room and people looking at it, not really knowing what it's about, and then being guided into this conversation and having this polite conversation as well. You know, not just going, oh, black lives matter or white lives matter. It's just talk about the art and then have this nice conversation about it. So most of my work that I produce, I don't produce because of something. I'll produce, like all artists, is we're just playing, we're experimenting mm. with, the, with the material. And the material actually, or the piece of work that we produce, will say something. Or we'll have a memory of looking at an image in a book and it'll just say, right, this actually looks like this, and I'm going to dedicate it to something. So a piece of work I named Emmett Till. You know, the story's just horrific. But um, I dedicated this piece of work to Emmett Till because I wanted his story to be told. And it will be told forever and a day now. It's in a place where this story will be out well, there. Well, maybe let's tell the story for people who, who don't know it. Okay, so Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy in, uh, in America. And he was in North America. And he had to travel down to South to see his relations. And obviously, the North wasn't as segregated and you didn't have the Jim Crow laws there. So when he did get down to the south, he went into a shop and he allegedly wolf whistled at a lady or said some derogative comment. He never did, never said anything. But the brothers of this lady decided to go to his uncle's, put him in the back of a, a lorry, take him to a, a field and basically beat him up, pulled out his eyes, gorged his eyes out, tied him to a fan, a great big industrial fan and threw him into the river. They found his body, and his um, wow, his uh, his mother was that emotional and disturbed of what they'd done. She thought, "I'm going to show this what they what these people have done." And then she had an open casket. And this woman was so brave, mm. you know. She was going through all this torment and emotion, but she was still brave enough to show what society had done just because of the colour of your skin. And when I read the story, I was just nothing really went in. I was looking at all these images. And um, there was nothing there because I'd just spent all weekend just looking and researching. But the next, the next day on a Monday, I had to go to university. And as I'm sat there talking to the lecturer, I've got this ceramic bowl in front of me. And it's got blood and stuff coming out of it. I just burst out into tears because all these emotions had actually built up. And I couldn't say what I wanted to say. And what I wanted to say to the lecturer was, I wonder how big a bowl I'd have to produce to hold the tears of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters who've cried over their loved ones who have been brutally murdered just because of the color of their skin. But I couldn't get that out at the time. Mm. But what I did discover from that is that I've got to have this conversation. You know, I've got to have a conversation about Emmett Till, George Stinney, George Floyd, and all these thousands of other people that have died. And... I was just a plumbing and heating engineer, you know. I never signed up for this when I went to university. But I found that doing things like this and, it, and engaging with different people, everybody seems to be wanting to talk about it now. And especially after George Floyd, you know, there's been this great big flow where it doesn't matter what colour you are, they're realising that things have got to change. And I realised through art, it's possible. So how do you turn, because we have pictures rolling either side of us, um, but how do you turn Emmett Till's story, mm -hmm. tragic story, into a work of art from glass? Experimentation, really. <laughs> I'm just getting materials that are around me. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not a big sketchbook person. I don't draw things. Obviously, being from plumbing and eating, I've got rules to follow. And art gives me that therapy of not having to follow rules. I can be as free as I want to be and not let things tie me down. So... I'll do a piece of glass and it will sit there and it might sit there because I don't know what to do with it. And then another element will come in. I'll do a ceramic bowl, but it doesn't quite fit something that I want to do. Then I'll find another object. And it's only finding all these objects. They, they help me produce something I do. And once I start positioning them and tying them up down and stringing them up, 
then the story comes. So all these images that I've seen of Emmett Till and George Stinney mm. are all in my brain, but I'm not producing work because of them. Mm. It's because the material that I'm involved with, once I start to structure it, then it's like, that reminds me of such a phrase that I've, I've read or a, such an image, and it just, it, just, it just happens. Do you draw? Very, uh, I used to draw like, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd put an object in front of you and I'd be so critical and it would be like, you know, I've got to do this actually precise, but now I don't. I just get paints and I just splosh it around and I'm really free to what I used to be because I don't want to fit the constraints of an artist or as a drawer. You know, I'm trying to do, everything that I try to do is I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be identified as a ceramicist or a glass blower. For me, I'm just an artist that's playing around with materials and mm. enjoying the process. Kate, what about you? I mean, because you, <coughs> your process, it seems to me, there's, there's an element of intuition, but then you have this huge library of glazes, so, so you're also into the, the detail. I mean, do you draw before you start? Or what's I your, do what's draw, your process? and I study plants, and I, I sort of draw ideas and try and... I draw in my mind, really, in three dimensions, and then try and sketch it out. And then I might start... I might have quite a fixed idea. I've got a thing at the moment about looking at uh, twigs in winter and how you identify different trees through the way they are in winter, not with their leaf. So I've got this sort of vision of these tall vases that are very sculptural. Um, and studying them, bring them together, but then it's, I might start three pieces and make one follow the original idea and let the other two fly and just respond to, to what's happening mm. and turn it on its side or turn it upside down or change things. But I'm really interested in what you were saying, Bill, about in Australia, when this mentor of yours told you to burn, stretch, wet the leather. Was she doing that for her benefit because she wanted to see what you would, or was she doing it, letting you loose in her studio for your own sake? She, she was just, she very was very, she just encouraged me to push the material. And, and she did she was observe very and then draw from that, or was it for you, for it you? It was for me just to experiment. Yeah. She just really wanted me to push it, push the material. It's almost and as if sort of you should have experimental holidays, because you have to be <laughs> practical, you have to run a workshop, yeah. I've got yeah. people to pay and bills to pay, and, but at the same time, you know, I, I sort of reward myself with being really playful yeah, and yeah. letting things, and that you mustn't lose track of, because that's the seed, that's the Definitely. seed of all things. Otherwise you're just sort of, Play, you're, you're just sort yeah. of fiddling with a little bit of learning, where you need to deepen and deepen by stretching yourself, by, like you mm. say, assembling things by chance. I relate to you by saying you might have a piece of pipe or wire or glass and, and you collage them together That's into it, a piece definitely. using your instinct. Because I've looked at your work, it's very, uh, the composition is so strong. Mm -hmm. So you have this great innate sense of composition. And the same thing will apply in the studio. I might have a hundred balls that one of my apprentices have made during lockdown in, that are wet in boxes. And I don't actually know what I'm going to do with them. And I sort of, although they have, they've all already cost, I'm always aware of cost. Mm. And those three boxes might have cost 2,000 pounds in somebody's time. But then to sort of throw that away and mm. just wham them together and play and very, you know, just you gotta play. today, I've learned a lot today. Well, I'm, I'm quite intrigued that, is, that dovetails with something I was going to ask, which is when you get bigger and both you guys have uh, a team, studios, mm. employees, I mean, does that add a pressure to the work, and, and how do you how do you organise your studio? <laughs> well, everything's upside down now because of COVID. Yeah. So on the sure. day of COVID, we all looked at each other, and everybody had they only worked for me two days a week, so they have their own studio, so they were able to take equipment, tools, clay to their studios, literally in taxis that day, and they've been working remotely, and right. I've been trying to design remotely. It's been a very interesting sort of way. So everything's changed. I don't know if it'll ever be the same. The dynamics completely changed. Mm. But it is a pressure, yes. Uh, th nowadays, I'm sort of waking up, and I used to think, right, you know, what's Mariah doing? What's Henry? What are they all doing? To you know, you just have to occupy them weeks ahead. If I go away for a month, then that has to be timetabled. So there's a new freedom that I'm only just feeling now mm. of not having that prerequisite. And, and it's sort of very formulaic what they're doing and less experimental. So I'm looking forward to us getting together and doing that again, but uh, everything has changed. I don't think it'll go back. I mean, do you see yourself as managing your team? Well, it's like a conductor, isn't right. it? So mm. um, I play to their strengths. If they're interns, I play to their weaknesses and develop that, you know, and try and educate them and teach them. But if I'm paying them a good amount of money, 
then I play to their strengths and use their skills. Mm. And so it's sort of formulaic, but that's only to the degree of when they arrive at the studio now. And then there's no formula, it's all playing. And again, it's just trying to forget and assemble and collage, like, mm -hmm. you know, so. Mm -hmm. But um, that I think I've gone down from nine to three. Oh, really? You know, makers at the moment, Interesting. yeah. Interesting. And it's nice, it's kind of relaxing after 30 years of having my foot hard down on the pedal. <laughs> <laughs> but the experimenting is interesting, isn't it? Because we do, about every six weeks or two months or so, we have an experimental day in the studio. Mm -hmm. And people ask, oh, well, we want to do some wet moulding or we want to do some dyeing or we want to do... Or I, I think, oh, I'm kind of thinking braiding. I want to do some braiding stuff or something. And then everybody does it. And I really encourage everybody to do it. So the designers get involved as well. The, the marketing people get involved. Anybody who wants to get in the studio and phones get turned off and we just mess around for a day. Wow. And it's really interesting what has come out of that, of just literally... What has come out of it? Well, quite a few things, like structural leather work. You know, I was interested in whether you could make whether you could use leather without a without a skeleton and we've developed a whole line of furniture around structural i think it's one of them is up there yeah, yeah there's a stool there that's got no skull structure in it um we we st i started to get into knotting and braiding i joined the international federation of knot tires wow. <sighs> are there many of you <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's really interesting and, and knotting leather is I met an extraordinary Aboriginal um, man in Australia who taught me braiding. Right. And, and that started a kind of fascination with it. It's real kind of finger fun. And um, anyway, so we had a whole day on braiding. And as a result of that, we just made a, a, a li whole lighting collection around knotting and braiding. Interesting. I mean, was there a point in your career, because we have a lot of makers in the audience, was there a point in your career where, well, in fact, I know this, but you had shops. You had yeah. all sorts of things, and, and presumably you must have been spending a lot of your time managing and not that yeah. much time working with leather. And I didn't enjoy it. Mm. I really didn't enjoy it. And, and it got, I just turned, I suddenly sort of stopped one day and I'd, I'd become a businessman, which was never my intention. And so I, and, and so what I did actually is I built a studio in my garden for myself again. So I could just get back on the bench and just start making mm. stuff. And then I licensed the whole bag business away to another group of people to operate. So I could just focus the crafts side of the business and the design side of the business just on architecture and furniture and, and, and completely reorganize the business. And it's been, and it's been great, mm. actually. It's a wonderful thing to do. And I got rid of lots of people. You know, we, I, was, we had lot, I had too many staff and shops and what have you. I just found the whole thing really tedious. Um, but now it's fun and interesting and every, it's bespoke. It's much more curious. So was there a moment where you woke up and you said, right, I'm changing everything? Or was it a slow realisation? No, I think, yeah, it was a bit of a moment. It was a bit of a moment. I think it was just like, um, this isn't fun anymore. And then I, I, got, I started with my little thing back in the shed at the end of the garden. It was like, I'm having much more fun yeah. doing this. And, uh, you know, I'm... I'm going to die at some stage. I don't want to spend the rest of my this life. This is true. You know. <laughs> I mean, one, one of the things I'm, I'm keen to pull out, and one of the reasons for this talk is, is kind of things that you have in common, despite the fact you work in different materials. I mean, I guess one of the things that's come up is, is um, dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if having dyslexia, being diagnosed with dyslexia, means that you think you look at the world in a, in a different way. Totally different way, isn't and ca it? Can you try and describe... Because, I, because there's a, a huge proportion of designers, architects, artists, makers who are dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm quite keen to discover, you know, if you can describe how you think you see the world differently. I suppose, and, and when did that emerge? I suppose for me, being a well, glass blower come artist, is that um, you look at glass blowers or ceramicists or leather workers, is that you, you're looking at a traditional method of making something that's been passed down through the centuries. With my dyslexic head, I'm looking at it and thinking, well, why should I do what they've already done? And that's where this dyslexia comes in, is that you're looking at a process, although you're going to use them techniques, is that you then do it how you want to do it. Mm. So you're not going to do it the same as them. And it's not because you want to not follow the rules, which I don't want to do anyway, but it's just that you do see this material in a different way, and a different way of working. Um, and I think that going against the grain 
it's, it's very brave, isn't it? It's a brave situation mm -hmm. to be in because you've got people that have done this for centuries and they're doing materials and they're making stuff that looks absolutely exquisite. And then when you turn that on the head and you do something that's quite out of the norm, being identified as a glass blower when you're not actually using it as these traditions is then, you know, you get sort of like outcast. But with me, all my life I've been an outcast. You know, being mixed race mm. is that you don't quite fit into society. You don't fit into the black side and you don't fit into the white side. So all my life I've always been on the edge of not being in the inner circle. The same as with my making. I don't feel as if I'm a ceramicist or a glass blower. I don't f want to be identified as anything. And I think the whole world's going like that. You know, sexuality. People are uh, being called all different things now. And I don't, you know, I don't even know all the abbreviations. There's just that many of them. And, I've, and I think not being identified is a way of being identified. You know, I'm Chris Day, and that's who I am. I'm not a ceramicist. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm mm. just Chris Day, who's loving the material, loving playing with it, and telling a story. I mean, you've had this hinterland, you know, being the plumbing, uh, engineering, uh, how does that feed into your process, Chris? I'm using the materials that um, I use through my career, and I suppose it's like a comfort blanket. I've got these things that I was working with for nearly 20-odd years that I, I know how to use. So when I start to bring them into an environment where I'm quite scared is that at least I've got you know, a bit of copper. I know what I'm doing with that. I've got some wire. I know what I'm doing with that. So I'm bringing these elements in, and the thing is, they're aesthetically, they're beautiful. You know, you get a piece of copper and you put some heat on it and it goes all iridescent colours and you've got all these different textures that are on there. And I love that. You know, when I was putting a boiler on the wall or taking one off and all it had gone all verdigris and green, that was lovely to me. I could mm. see something that was really aesthetic pleasing, but for most people, they wanted to wire wool it off and get rid of it all, whereas I wanted to embrace it. And so I'm using just materials that I, I fall in love with, you know, mm. and I think... You know, I'm using rope and chains, which in the past have been a brutal, significant identity to black people. But for me, the beauty is to actually talk about something that is brutal, but bring it into a piece of uh, artwork that can have that conversation. Mm. Mm. There's something about technique, though, that I think is interesting, is that you get, once you get, once you have a technique that you've completely mastered, you've got a language. You, you've, you've actually learned a language, and it's mm -hmm. a three-dimensional language that you can speak, and, and, and that's the way you can talk about things mm. in 3D. And I think, that's, I think it's a very important element. You know, that whole idea of, getting, of, of mastering technique is so important for, for any craftsperson, I think. And I think that's, that's, that's where craftspeople speak together is in their, in their techniques. Mm. But on the technique side, I mean, I like, I like the glass because you, if, you let it, if you let it run, it will run. So when I'm heating the glass up, you're putting all this energy in there, heat-wise, and it goes to this molten liquid that just wants to run away. You, you know, like I was saying before, you know, you can put a piece of clay on a pot as well, and it'll just sit there. Whereas as soon as you heat glass up and you blow into it, Gravity, if you hold it up, it just wants to go. It's got this life of its own. Never, I can't think of any other material that will do that, except for paint that's on a wall. That will drip down. So you, you've got no control of this material. So technically, you can let this material do most of the artwork for you. All you've got to do is just rein it in a little bit. Yeah. So you've got to be able to manipulate it and have this technical ability. But yeah. on the other hand, you don't need it because you can let that do whatever it's what, what it wants to do. You do need it, but you can choose not to use it. Exactly. Yeah, that's I mean, it. That's, yeah. the, that's, that's, yeah. the point. that's the point, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the more skills you have, the yeah. more are available to you, like an alphabet. That's right. Yeah. But you don't have to use the whole alphabet. But, but, you, but you imagine a master glass blower. He's got all this technical skill. He's going to hone this piece of glass into its last eighth, and it's going to be absolutely precise and beautiful. Just think what he could do if he just let it go. Mm. You know, and just think, you mm. know what, I don't want to be like all them that are doing beautiful vases. I'm just going to let it fall and drop and droop and do whatever it wants. But sometimes that technical ability holds them back because they don't want to do that. Because we, they 
they want to fit that criteria of being absolutely pristine of what they're doing. We're being uh, live streamed to Murano as we talk, oh, and there are, okay. there are people shaking <laughs> their fists. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, the, the other thing, uh, the other thing that strikes me that that both Bill and Kate have in common is this desire to work at scale, to work at architectural scale. Yeah. Um, uh, we have six minutes left, according to the ticker, so I'm very aware. I don't want to introduce too much too soon. But um, why architecture? What was the interest in architecture? Because you've, you've tiled whole buildings, right? And I huge, have, yeah. Huge I've buildings. clad, as part clad. of the team, yeah. I've clad buildings, the facades on buildings. I think it's basically, I love, I, I'm hypnotized by challenge. And so to sort of be, so, well, no, it's, there's, all, there's too many reasons to talk about that in the last five minutes. But essentially, my pots, my expensive, elaborate, time-consuming pots, serve, serve a community, be it collectors, museums, or wealthy people who can afford to have them. But potters have always served a community with their bread panchions and their flower pots and their cups and saucers. And of course, industry has taken that uh, a essential need of potters to serve a community. We, we don't really need to do that. So I felt it was a balance to work and make large work, which I've always wanted to do, but for hospitals, parks, schools, libraries, and serve a community as a craftsman in a different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, much like a plumber can serve a community by making the heating work. Definitely. You know, it's a matter of making the environment very beautiful and to challenge myself personally. So the scale, you know, I've done maybe 20 public art projects that started on a little hydrotherapy pool panel beside a, a, in a hospital in Southampton, and just step by step by step, not really aiming to make profit, but to learn. I've gone up through to the facade of Savile Row, uh, which was a, you know, a huge seven-story building that we clad, but mm. I was part of a team, and that's lovely. I was going to say, that must be a very different it. experience. It's quite relaxing. Is it? <laughs> you know, in, in a way it is. That, you know, they're calling on you as the artist to be the creative one, but public art is 5% creativity and 95% per perseverance, tenacity, and endurance. So to hand over a lot of that to other people and not be the leader of it is mm. great. Because mm. when you're making a pot, you're the leader and you're the decider. Mm -hmm. But to then be part of a team is, is very exciting. I mean, Bill, do you, do you feel the same when you've done, because you've done major architecture. Yeah, but I, I'm fascinated by architecture. Mm. I think architecture is a, is a great bringing together of materials because you have these really simple materials that things have to get built out of. So you have this elemental mm. aspect of architecture and then kind of shape, scale, light, all of that stuff becomes really pertinent as well. Um, and then when you start to introduce, you know, w when you start to show leather in its, in, in its full possibility in architecture, it's, I think it's really exciting because the scale of it you can you can bring it right up and make it really big. And it's, and it, it's, it's just brings out the curiosity of it. Mm. And the scale of it, I think, is so interesting. This notion of being part of a team, which I yes, think is quite absolutely. interesting. I mean, it's very different from making a handbag. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. And, and I, like, um, I like the way architects think. I mean, my mm. mother was an architect, obviously, so it probably helped. But, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's, you just, I like that whole, um, I like the universality of it all. I like the fact that it's public. I like the fact that you, it's complicated, you know, it's properly complicated. Mm. Um, and, and also trying to refine something relatively complicated to look really simple, mm. I really like. I like that sort of illusion mm. of, oh, that looks really simple. It just looks like leather on the wall. Yeah, well, you know, you try and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Chris, you're kind of, uh, your, your career is kind of nascent and you, you've broken through into this, I guess, collector's market, really. Yeah. But do you have ambitions to go into other, other areas, I wonder? Yeah, well, I've, I'm, I'm doing an exhibition um, end of this month and that's up at Harewood House. Ah. And, that's, and that's a big installation piece. Uh, there's about five, five um, art pieces on show. And it's about this uh, interaction with an audience, isn't it? So when you go to installations and you've got architecture, you're going into the public domain. You know, most people in the audience here know about art. But when you go into a public area, you'll interact with people that have perhaps got anything, nothing to do with art, mm. but they can interact with it, you know. Um, so Harewood House will be brilliant because it's, um, it'll be in a church and you'll have people just going there for picnics and enjoying the day and seeing the birds that are up there in the collection. And then they'll perhaps go into the church and engage with aspects of slavery. Uh, so you've got this juxtaposition of two different things, mm. but you've got you bring in people into a realm that they perhaps not have or be engaging with. So 
installations is uh, are very good for uh, the masses. So this, this is the way forward? Could be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's a really lovely place to end it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to Bill, to Kate, and to Chris. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for coming. It's been marvellous to see you. It's been so wonderful to have laughter, actually, live Yay. coming out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you could give it up for the panel, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I agree with, uh, with Grant. It has been absolutely lovely to see people here at the Design Centre. Gosh, oh making, experimenting, storytelling, creating an important dialogue. There's a lot of passion and, uh, and bravery to, your, to the way that you use materials. And um, uh, thank you so much, Chris, Kate, Bill and Grant for sharing your world with us today. Thank you very much indeed. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.